sense that Joseph sort of uh, went berserk in Nauvoo, giddy with his own power, and uh, overstepped all sorts of bounds. Uh, those two I'm not going to deal with in the talk, though uh, we can discuss them in the question period if you, if you choose. Well, let me begin with treasure seeking. It's a strange one to start with, but I think it has an interesting moral to it. I'm not sure that treasure seeking is, in anyone's mind nowadays, much of a problem when it comes to understanding uh, Joseph Smith, at least not among um, anyone who has read the recent historiography. But uh, when I began work uh, on Joseph Smith and the beginnings of Mormonism in the late 60s and early 70s, it was the premier problem of Joseph Smith, couched uh, perhaps most acutely by Jan Ships in her essay, The Prophet Puzzle, in which Joseph Smith seemed to have this bifurcated history and personality. On one side, he's the young visionary, and on the other side, he's the young money digger. And the two seem to be totally incompatible. One is superstitious and kind of greedy, the other is exalted and religious and, and pious in every way. And it was interesting at that time because there were a whole set of sources lined up on each side of this divide. Um, on the money digging, digging side, the two primary bodies of evidence were the affidavits that Philastus Hurlbut collected in Palmyra when he was on his mission to discredit Joseph Smith, and the neighbors happily provided him evidence, uh, many of the accusations having to do with treasure seeking. And the second being the 1826 court trial, which was recorded in documents whose provenance was questionable, and so no one uh, was able to say for sure whether this trial occurred, but at in these transcripts of events at, in court, Joseph Smith uh, speaks of money digging, the, even his friends speak of him as a treasure seeker and so on. Well, that set of documents were, uh, were available to Von Brody and everyone else who wanted to build up the, the treasure seeking side, but among faithful Mormons, among which I counted myself, the, these documents were not just judged and evaluated like every historical document was, has to be, they were totally discredited. They, they were just said to have no validity at all. The, the very occurrence of the 1826 trial was in doubt and everything was thought to be a pure fabrication. And the Hurlbut affidavits were considered to be so biased, probably almost totally the creation of Hurlbut himself, that they simply weren't taken into account. You didn't even deal with them in the faithful history of Joseph Smith. Of course, on the other side, the, on the visionary side, you have uh, countless accounts, beginning with the, Joseph Smith's own records, and Lucy Mack Smith's, and Emma, and Oliver Cowdery, and Martin Harris, and many others who talked at length about Joseph uh, Joseph's um, visions. So we had sort of these two parallel histories scarcely uh, touching one another. And my question as a historian was how am I going to deal with this? Am I really going to discredit all of these documents or not? I felt like I had to deal with them in some way as evidence. Well, a couple of things happened as I began to work on this earlier book. Uh, one, it became evident that the faithful sources, Martin Harris and Lucy Mack Smith and others, also spoke of money digging and treasure seeking. So it became uh, almost impossible to deny those activities. Um, the Josiah Stoll search for treasure had always been accepted, but now it seemed apparent 
there were much more money digging in the Smiths' lives than had been thought of before. The second was a uh, change in the evidence was the 1826 trial was validated by this uh, little scrap of evidence that uh, Wesley Walters discovered um, seeming to prove that the event had taken place. And I remember as just in the middle of writing that book, all of this evidence was being debated and I had to write in such a way that I left room for those who still doubted the 1826 trial to sort of have their say and their voice and at the same time uh, to bring it within the Latter-day the, the Latter Saint canon of acceptable evidence. So um, altogether, it, my task was to conceive, not to deny money digging, but to conceive of what part it played in Joseph Smith's early life. I couldn't es escape that fact. Well, my um, encounter with Joseph's treasure seeking came in two stages corresponding to these two books uh, published uh, 20 years apart. Um, in B Joseph Smith in the beginnings of Mormonism, I was, uh, my strategy was essentially to neutralize the charge because as I was writing, the scholarship about treasure seeking and magic in general was proliferating in Anglo-American historiography. So it became evident that these practices were commonplace in the 17th century in all levels of society, in the 18th and 19th century among uh, common people and the lower classes. So that once you spread out this process so that Joseph Smith is not a peculiarly weird version of treasure seeking but that it was uh, widely practiced, suddenly it was no longer a blot on his character, his family's character. It was no more scandalous than, say, gambling, playing poker today. A little bit discredited and slightly morally disreputable, but not really evil. And when it was found that all sorts of treasure seekers were also serious Christians, why not the Smiths too? So instead of being a puzzle or a contradiction, it was just one aspect of Smith family culture and not really anything to be worried about. Well, that's how far I got in Joseph Smith in the beginnings of Mormonism. In Rough Stone Rolling, I go one step further in a slightly more speculative vein but one I think worth seriously considering, and that is to see magic and money digging as providential, that is, as useful in the training of a prophet. And why that uh, struck me uh, more forcibly uh, this go around was that I came to see what a huge leap of faith trans the translation commandment required. It was a totally unheard of, unprecedented charge from an angel to tell a young man to translate an ancient record without any learning, strictly by the use of a stone, the crystals or the found uh, seer stone. And I wanted to emphasize that because I think we've underestimated the problem of self-belief. Why should Joseph believe in his own revelations? We think of them as overpowering, irresistible, but we have to remember that this was a society that was filled with visionaries, filled with revelations, filled with angels coming to people, most of which were discredited why should this young man believe that his revelations were truly of God rather than a figment of his own imagination? You do remember that when Joseph Smith went to the hill the first time and could not get the plates out of the stone box 
for a moment, there flashed across his mind, according to Oliver Cowdery, the thought that 